Again, good morning. Did you guys receive the message concerning the exam being extended or not? Corny didn't? Okay, somebody did at least. Was it via the Canvas or, or through the email? Via Canvas, yes. Let okay. me check it right now. Uh, somebody's nodding. Okay, yeah, it, it, uh, it came through Canvas so that it was extended, but it should popped up on your email if you have it set up with the Canvas. Okay. Oh yeah, this morning, yeah, I just got it. Okay. Okay, very good. Listen, uh, guys, please don't leave it to the last minute and start uh, preparing for the exams. That's really not a good way of doing uh, stuff. So I really strongly suggest that you guys do, do it as soon as you have a chance. Don't leave it to the last minute. Then we discover issues. There was a discrepancy of about half an hour. I think in the announcement, it was saying that it's going to be made avail uh, available until 11.30 p.m. But then uh, it, uh, it expired at 11 p.m. So that's an error on my part. But please don't live to that. Don't don't stay to that minute, basically, and start preparing for your exam because that's not good. Since the exam was changed from today until uh, Thursday, so that's fine. We can extend it, and I did extend it till tomorrow evening. Again, don't leave it until like half an hour, and then you think that maybe I should start reviewing the, this exam. That is too late. That is uh, that is not really going to be conducive to well a good preparation for the exam. That is my suggestion for you guys. And hopefully Thursday you will be ready for the exam as planned. Okay. There were two or three people who had issues with this uh, time delay. I know some of you had issue had to go somewhere on Monday and things like that, especially since this class is not offered on Monday. So they couldn't do it. But the hope is that you had uh, enough time for you guys to do it before Monday. Anyway, so let's get into chat today's chapter. So we are doing chapter two of uh, basically exam two, namely chapter nine now. So we're moving, uh, let me see what is my notes in here. Yep, that's chapter nine from this book on magnetism. So let me share this screen. Okay. Again, a good morning for those who are here again, and those who are not watching good whatever time it is. Hopefully uh, everything is according to plan. We have uh, quite a few people who are not live with us and hopefully they are catching up on these materials. Uh, there was an issue again last week. Yesterday, I didn't see it much, but again, if it happens where for some reason, we're disrupted right in the middle of the lecture by Zoom. Oh, I'm sorry. Yesterday, it happened too. For the morning class, basically, Zoom froze on us. So I restarted my Zoom. And I was basically the, the, the students who were in that class, they came back and continued the class. We, I never end abruptly the class without basically proper, basically, uh, ending of the class. Uh, usually we go always to the to the time when it's supposed to end. So if you notice that half an hour or 45 minutes right in class, we went black, blank basically, please restart and uh, come back so that we finish the class, okay? Good. Okay. Uh, and then the recordings yesterday, they went fine, but in the past, the recording take a long time to, uh, to show up. Anyway, so today's topic is about magnetism and magnet. Actually, today marks exactly one year after the passing of my uh, thesis advisor, Professor Harry Sewell. Professor Harry Sewell was known the most knowledgeable person on magnetism who was alive. Okay, Unfortunately, he passed away last year, and he was my thesis advisor, and uh, we worked on magnetism. So this is a topic that I should know. Okay. Since he was known for it, okay. So, what magnet? What is magnetism? So that's really the question, okay. So we talked about electricity, for example, and we said electricity. It has to do with charges. If you have a charge, you can play the game. Like an electron is allowed into that game. A proton is allowed into that game. A neutron cannot play the game of electricity. However. What is going on with the with the with the uh, magnets? Okay, this are not charged particles because if they are, I'm touching them. Okay, yet they are magnets and they do this game. 
I attach one of them. I have two of them actually here. And then if I bring them closer, they attach. And if I bring them to the wrong side, basically, they can't. They don't want to be next to one another. If I let go of this one, it's going to fly away. Actually, as a matter of fact, I'm working very hard to push them against one another. So they seem to be polar. In a sense, they have one side different than the other. So they have one pole different than the other, just like the charges. Charges also are polar. In a sense, there is a positive charge and a negative charge. Same thing with these guys. They also have poles in them. This side, if I've tried to push them against one another, they don't. Okay, And uh, if you flip them around, they attract. So they are similar to charges. If you have these poles of one kind, they repel. If I flip them both and bring the other sides also, they should do the same thing. They repel. Now, if I turn one and not the other, now they attract. Okay? It doesn't matter which one I turn. So the attraction is going to happen. So the point being in here is similar poles attract, I mean, uh, repel, and different poles attract. That's basically the idea behind it. Okay. The fact that we call them north and south is just our convention. We could have called them positive and negative. We could have called them John and Bob or whatever name you want to call them. There is not really much significance, honestly, to north and south other than the fact that a compass I used to have one handy and I don't know where my compass is, points to the north, OK? So no matter which way you are, it always points to the north. Okay. Then people notice that if you go to certain mountains, like for example, those mountains near Athens, and you bring those rocks, the neither points to them. Okay, not to the north. Okay. <laughs> so they seem to have this property that they turn the needle, I mean of the of the compass specifically according to which way you change them. If the needle was pointing this way, and if you turn the rock around it, it's going to basically go around it. So this property was something interesting, of course, superstition and things like miracles and things like that, they were associated with this phenomenon. It was called magnetism due to a name in the area near, uh, near Greece, okay? So it was with the ancients and we really did not understand what magnets are. So today's topic is, of the discussion, what is magnets? You need to tell me in your own words, what do we mean? What creates, what causes magnetism? I was young, I was actually in middle school. And like any one of you guys, I had magnets to play with. I have a bunch of magnets actually. These are magnets, this is actually a magnet. These are also magnets. And these are super strong and nasty magnets, oh, man. Okay, made out of cobalt. This is actually also made out of cobalt. This is actually a plastic material made out of cobalt, which is also mag magnetized. So there are three materials that do that, nickel, cobalt, and uh, iron, okay? They have this property that if you magnetize them, they stay magnetized, okay? And like some other materials, you magnetize them, but when you remove the cause of magnetism, they go. They, they go back to normal and magnetized materials. And iron and any material actually can lose its magnetism. As a matter of fact, like I was saying, I was very young and it was a very cold night and I had a magnet and I was playing with it and everything else. And it's, we had the, we had the uh, fire going actually with the, not the fire, what do you call it? The electrical heater going. So I took a spoon, I put the magnet inside the spoon and I brought it to fire and I was watching it, okay? to see what's gonna happen. I had no idea. I didn't read about anything at that time. I was just basically playing with my magnets. Then when I put it again on the piece of, uh, uh, on the side of the, uh, the heater, it did not attract to the heater. Man, I was the most disappointed ever. I was really, I felt completely, that was, I lost magnetism. I lost my magnets. So I went to my science teacher and I told him what I did. And he told me, you reached the Curie temperature. What is the Curie temperature? He said that is the temperature when the thermal agitation inside the magnet becomes too high 
that the magnetic domains change their orientation from being aligned in one specific direction to give you magnetism to basically become completely uh, unmagnetized. They become random. Of course, I didn't understand a lot of what he was saying. I was in middle school at that time, but I was curious enough trying to understand it. Sure enough, I went to high school, undergrad and graduate school, and that was the thesis that I worked on, on magnetism, okay? Just to tell you the story from middle school sticks with you for a long, long time. So now I understand what, uh, what the Curie temperature is and what this stuff is, okay? So the point being in here is you can lose magnetism and you can take a material like iron that is not magnetized and magnet make it magnetized. This case, you have a permanent magnet as opposed to non-permanent magnets. So we really have magnets that are not permanent magnets. And those are the so-called electromagnets. Okay, those use very high currents to generate magnetism, which is usually a lot stronger than the permanent magnets. In laboratory, for example, in nuclear accelerators and elementary particle physics, they use super strong, usually superconducting materials to reach extremely high magnetic fields, okay, that are very, very, very strong, okay, and that is they use a different kind of magnets. Those are electromagnets. So magnetism comes in two flavors. There is a permanent. Those are your everyday refrigerator type magnets, okay? And then there is the industrial and also scientific magnets that are used and even in cars and uh, motors and things like that. And those are the electromagnets. Obviously this one is caused by electricity. If you don't have electricity, it doesn't work. So what in the world causes this guy? That is the topic of the day. That is what I want you guys to come up with today, to understand from which today. Magnetism is at the heart of everything in terms of technology today, in, te in terms of power generation. Without magnetism, you cannot have electricity in your household, okay? And the reason, again, is because magnets are actually or magnetism specifically is the other side of the story. You have two sides of the story. You have electricity which is one side of the story. You have the other side of the story which is magnetism. In modern physics we know that an electric field from a different perspective is actually a magnetic field. A magnetic field from a different point of view is actually an electric field. Hence the word that you, you, you hear a lot today, which is electromagnetism. So the two things are like you have a quarter and you're looking at both sides of it. On one side you have tail and the other side you have heads. Which one is heads, which one is tail is just a matter of semantics which one is electric field, which one is magnetic field. It's just a matter of basically your perspective, that's all, okay? So this is in a nutshell what the topic is all about today. Again, please don't let it be that we end the class without answering this question, what causes magnetism, okay? Can you guys promise? Okay, <laughs> because we have to understand what it is. I mean, uh, regardless of what you do in life, whether you're a technician in the, in the, in the lab in some sort of a medical uh, facility, or you are uh, going to be an elementary teacher or kindergarten or something, or you're going to be somewhere else, you'll be confronted with this question by a kid somewhere, okay? You're going to have to answer that question. You have to tell them what it is, okay? And believe it or not, kids nowadays are super smart they will know when <laughs> what you're saying is correct or not, okay? So, again, we have what we call North Pole and we have what we call South Pole, okay? It's clearly, we have two different kinds of uh, magnetism that I demonstrated earlier that is kind of different, okay? They have one way or the other. It seems like in my representation of fields, 
that this configuration is repulsive, okay? Because I try to push them and they cannot, okay? I have two similar colors in here, blue colors. That's how they are labeled. I have two similar colors in here. That's how they are labeled red. So if I take the red and the red, no matter how much I try, they, they will not work. If I take red and blue, I don't even need to do much stuff. Actually, they're going to attract to one another. So this is basically the whole the whole point in here. So don't read too much into why we call them north and south. We call them north and south because the Earth itself is actually a magnet. Earth itself is actually a big magnet. So the Earth, if you look at it, it has field lines that look like this. Okay. So I drew it backward. Okay. So let me really draw the earth. Okay. This is bad earth. So this is the field lines and how they do. Okay. So from uh, this is the south of the earth. This is the geometrical south. So when you look down and you point to south, that is the south, okay? So this is where San Diego is. And this is north. This is where San Francisco is, okay? So this is north from us. This is south from us. If you take a needle, a compass, it's going to port toward the north, just following this field line, okay? This is actually the magnetic north. a bit confusing, but this is actually a fact. This is the magnetic south. Just because we call this one the north, it's because the north, the geometrical north, where the geography, geographical north, if you want to call it geographical, what do you call it geometrical? Geographical. Okay, geographical south and geographical north are opposite to the magnetism because the needle of the compass points towards towards the geographical north, and the and the compass follows the field lines, and the field lines always point from north to south. Just like the charges. Okay, so if I take a needle right now, compass, and put it in here, this is how it's going to a point. So this is the compass, the way it's going to point, okay? It's going to point to the south, following this field lines. So those are the field lines of the magnetic field, okay? So again, why the name north and why the name south? It's because basically how we discovered that there are some special kind of uh, geometry that you can build with all kinds of materials and it points all the way no matter where you are on earth. So we took advantage of that and the Chinese did and then after that everybody else to navigate the seas because in the seas you can't see there is no landmark to basically help you which way you need to go. So as long as you know which way is south you can tell which way is east and west and you can more or less find your way back to land if you're lost. Okay so again the magnetic force force is attractive or repulsive between a pair of magnets, depending, depending on which one is, uh, which end of the magnet is held, behavior similar to electrical force, strength of the interaction depends on the distance. It also changes with distance far away from the, these two, and I hardly have any, any, any kind of interaction. Actually, in here, I have practically zero interaction. If I take this one and attach to a and here, it's only gravity right now that is pulling on it, okay? But if I bring this one closer to it, I can clearly see the force changing on it. So now it's, you see the, uh, I can measure this force now, okay? This force in here, I can measure the strength of this force between them. Of course, I have to subtract the gravity because if I remove this one, 
uh, I have to zero this one based on the gravity and then find the, the force. So this force depends on the distance. The further the distance, the weaker the force, okay? So this is basically how this is. Again, magnetic, uh, magnetic poles give rise to magnetic force, two types of interactions. So we have a North Pole or North Seeking Pole and South Seeking Pole rule for magnetic forces between magnetic like poles repel and opposite poles attract. Okay. So a weak and strong magnet repel each other. The greater repelling force is by Who, which one uh, repels the most? So you have a very, 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 very strong magnet. These are the field lines coming from it. This is south, by the way. Okay, And you have a weak Magnet. This is the north also. So the field lines are trying to ram into one another. Which one repels the most? Option one. This is A. Option two. This is B. Option C. Both the same. Or none of the above. What do you guys think? I would guess A. Okay, that's a good guess, actually, because you think that it's stronger. Think in terms of the third law of Newton. If I push on this wall by five Newton, how much do you think the wall would push back on me? Same amount. I would think that the third law would apply in this case, too. Okay. So if this guy is pushing with five Newton, the other guy must push by? Five Newtons. Yeah, it should be the same, okay? Because again, it's the third law of Newton that has nothing to do with uh, the strength of the magnetic field or anything like that. Okay, this is not an easy question, honestly. Uh, I know now in light of the third law, it makes sense. But uh, I was actually in a laboratory with somebody who was supposed to be a trained, in, trained engineer. And she was with somebody who was teaching actually physics and they brought uh, an, a strong magnet and they brought an, an electro, I mean, a weak magnet. And because the strong magnet overwhelmed the other one and basically pulled it towards it, they believe that they have discovered the third kind of interaction, an attractive force between a north and a north. And they thought, wait a minute, we have something different now. And both of them actually, the other one was supposed to be a trained physicist and the other one is supposed to be a trained engineer they couldn't fi find the fact that a strong magnet can induce a south magnet in the other one and involve basically reverse the polarity on it and attract it. So this is still, this is called the ferromagnet and this is a theory magnet and that phenomenon is nonsense, okay? So if you guys tripped on it, so don't, 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 uh, <laughs> don't feel bad because other people who are supposed to be trained in the field, sometimes they get confused about it. But in this case, once you remember the third law of Newton, it's obvious, okay? Doesn't matter how, how many Gauss, because the unit for the magnetic field is in Gauss and Tesla, regardless of how many Teslas you bring into the table, it's, it's the third law is at, at stake in here, okay? Make sense? Okay. So again, this would have been a fun lab. I know you guys are not doing lab. I would, uh, if we were in lab, I would have brought this stuff in the class and would have done it. Okay, <laughs> you can do it. So basically, what you do, you have the iron filings, which are sp uh, small pieces of iron actually, and made into a very very thin uh, hair-like uh, shape, and they are very small in size. And you sprinkle them on a piece of paper and make sure that they are uniform. Bring a a a, a, a magnet underneath and then you will see the the iron filings follow the field lines actually they will describe the field lines i mean they don't give you the arrow but they go from north to south exactly following the lines i was describing earlier this field line will leave 
and will somehow come back and merge in here. This fair line will leave, and if you follow it and you trace it, the pieces of uh, the iron filing is going to all come back in here. This fair line is going to, the line, if you follow the straight line, is going to continue, continue, and you're going to continue until you leave actually uh, uh, Riverside and you leave actually the entire state of California, end up somewhere in Europe, and then actually leave the entire planet and end up somewhere to the other side of the galaxy. And even before you reach the end of the universe, it's still going, okay? And you're gonna see it if somehow you make it from the other end of the universe and come back from the other side, it's the same line coming in here. In other words, these field lines are continuous and they make a closed loop, okay, on it. Here is a secret. This is another item that I want you to really remember from the discussion. Poles, magnetic poles that is, come in pairs. Okay, you cannot find a monopole by itself. You cannot, because here is the thing. Let me take this, oops, sorry about that. Let me take this bar magnet. Okay, this clearly has a north and a south. I can find out which one is which just by using this one, okay? Right now it's repelling. So this must be a red because it's repelling this red. Okay, if I flip this one, it's attracting to the blue. So this must be red. On the other side must be blue then. If I bring the blue to the other side, it's repelling. You guys see that? So this must be blue because if I now convert this one to a red, it's attracted to it. So it's attracted to red, so it must be blue. So this is blue, this is red. So I know the polarity in here. Here is what I'm gonna do. Do you think, I'm not going to do that so that you guys are. Uh, if I cut them, this one in the middle. This one is red. This one is blue. Do you think I will have the red by itself and the blue by itself? If I cut it right in the middle, smack in the middle. If I take this one in here and cut it right in here, bring that, those pliers, whatever thing, and cut it in here. Now I have the south by itself and the north by itself, or what? What do you guys think? I don't think so. I think you would have, you'd still have a, a north and a south on each half. <laughs> so where you had south, now a new north will pop up in here. And where you made the cut, where you ended up with the north on this side, uh, this side there will be a south. And now you end up with the north, albeit probably weaker magnets, but you have the same magnets basically, north and south. Let's think about this process now. Let's take this magnet now. Let's assume that this is the half of that, okay? So for example, this was my make magnet and this is the half of it, okay? So this is about half of that. So I'm gonna take, it's actually a lot less than half, and I'm gonna take this one now and cut it in half now, okay? Cut this one in half. Do you think, if I repeat the experiment somehow, I will end up with a north in here by itself and a south by itself, or is it not possible? I don't think so. <laughs> so what you're saying then is that you will end up with a south and a north, albeit smaller, yes? Correct, just weaker force. Okay, forget about the strength right now, just focus on the north and the south. I want ultimately to get to the bottom of this story, okay? So you know where I'm headed with this. I'm gonna take this guy now and cut it in half, okay? So what do you think I will have? Will I have ever the south by itself? What happened now? Somebody's shaking the head. <laughs> what do you guys think? Would I even have the south or north? Tanner, Maybe. what do you think? You might, Maybe. but it, it would probably be uh, not even noticeable when it's that small. So it's going to be a probably a north and a south. Is that what you're saying, basically? Yes. OK, here is the deal. I'm going to continue this process, OK? Until I reach a point. Do you think I will reach a point where I will have a south by itself at all? You would have to do a lot of cutting, but possibly. Possibly. 
here is the thing. People tried this thing, actually, okay? at least conceptually, okay? <laughs> and they failed. At the end, what they ended up with is nothing. Magnets is gone. So you either have two pairs or nothing at all. You guys understand? At the end, you will lose your magnet if you continue with this process. Magnet is lost, okay? In other words, you end up with, you ha either have two poles, namely north and south, or none at all. Because even if you come to the atomic level, there is remnants of uh, basically magnetism, even on the electron level itself has, an, has magnetic properties. So, but at some point, from a macroscopic perspective, from a big a picture, either you have one or not. In other words, no monopole has ever been observed. I just noticed that the light in here is kind of dim. But, uh, OK. Anyway, the point in me here is that no monopoles this is a very, very important point. This is a point of that can make or break basically the entire physics that we have today. Physics today relies on this idea, okay? Physics today relies on this point big time. A lot of things that we do on a daily basis rely on this purpose in here and this thing, okay? Uh, there was in the 1940s some experiment somewhere where people claimed to have isolated somehow a monopoles, but it, then they couldn't, those experiments could not be reprodu reproduced so there is no monopoles that exist, basically, only that come in pairs, dipoles. And like charges. Charges, you can have a positive charge by itself, a negative charge by itself, and a negative charge can do whatever it wants to do, then combine with a, ne a negative positive charge or whatever. So this is a big distinction between the two things, okay? Mono uh, magnets, they come always in pairs, okay? This is item of the discussion. This is item two. Remember, item one is still lingering out there, okay? Item one is still what causes magnetism. So again, magnetic fields produced by two kinds of uh, electron motion. So at the heart of it, when you're really on the atomic level, you have two kinds of things. You have the orbital motion of the electrons around the, the atom. And this is now a charge in motion. Charge in motion is a current. And that current is what causes magnetism. So what causes magnets are currents. And this can be done as an experiment, actually. I was going to do this, and I couldn't find my uh, coil. If I find the coil probably next time around, I will record it and probably post it or something. Anyway, so if you have a if you take a coil, for example, of current and put it in a battery, so this is a battery, okay? And turn the switch, usually you have a switch, okay? Connect the switch. So what happened in this case, there is a huge current. Now bring a piece of iron, it doesn't matter, or a needle from a compass and it's going to point toward the north and south and you'll have the magnetic field lines exactly similar to a magnet. So this is what an electromagnet actually is. So this is what causes electromagnetism uh, in the case of electromagnet. This too is caused by currents, except those currents in an, on the atomic level are moving electrons, basically. So an electronic move is really like a current. And then there is a property that we cannot really understand in terms of classical mechanics. We really have to invoke quantum mechanics to understand the electron has what appears, not trivial, okay? Don't, don't, don't imagine it, because if you imagine it, it's wrong. A property that seems to suggest, and this picture is wrong, that the electron spins around itself, okay? So it's called the spin, okay? Again, it's an internal property, just like the charge, right? Like the mass that suggests a picture, okay? As if the elect electron is spinning around its axis, so we call it the electron spin. This picture is wrong. Quantum mechanically, that doesn't make sense, but 
that property is also responsible. And it's for the most part responsible for a lot of the magnetism too, okay? This property actually is not inherent only to the electrons. Protons also have that. Neutrons also have that. That's why on a neutron star, where you really don't have anything but neutrons, it has the most fantastic and the strongest magnets that you can, you can even imagine to the point of some neutron stars are actually called magnetars because they have tremendous amount of magnetism. The magnetic force that you cannot ever imagine if uh, there is a magnetar not too far from us in here on, on earth, actually the entire planet, you and I would be deformed to a point that we would be completely, to, to an extent, it's actually far more dangerous. I mean, if a black hole comes in, then of course it's dangerous. You get beyond it uh, or event horizon, but a magnetar or even a neutron star, regular one, because of their magnetism, they're super strong. So the fact that neutron does not play electric forces, it plays this game because it has that property, which is called the spin. Basically, if you are wondering what's going on with the, uh, with the neutron stars, is basically gravity is so strong that the neutrons are neutrons, of course, but the proton and the, and, the, and the electron, they get smashed to one another and they become neutron. So basically the only thing is left in a neutron star are neutrons, that's it. That is responsible for tremendous amount of force. So spin, which has that classical picture that you probably have in your head, that like the earth is spinning around its axis doing 24 hours every day. This is the picture that we have. This is, if you wish, poor picture of describing the behavior of the electron or all of the elementary particles. So those two are responsible for the magnetism in general, okay? So why in the world some materials are magnet can be magnetized and have, have permanent magnets like nickel, like iron, like, uh, like cobalt, and others no, like aluminum, for example, or copper or gold, those are metals too. So why don't they keep on their magnetism? And it has to do with something called the self-consistent behavior. Those materials over regions of space, they have basically, here is the picture. So that we are clear on it. I have this atom, for example, it has electric, it's electron moving this way, for example, okay? For this materials, the next door neighbor atom has its electron spinning in the same direction. For the neighbor, next neighbor, the electron also is spinning in the same direction. So if I take a bunch of these atoms next to one another, and I put them all oriented in the same direction, all the electrons moving in the same direction, I put them all counterclockwise, basically. In this region where they meet, the, this electron is coming this way, the other one is moving this way, so they cancel one another. They cancel each other everywhere they meet, as a matter of fact. The, but on the overall picture, it looks like I have a big loop of a current surrounding this entire region, as if I have this region that has a current that looks like this. It's like that coil again. It's not too different from this coil. The picture is identical, but this is for a region called the domain. Bunch of atoms together. So now that bunch of atoms, they will have a magnetic field pointing, in this case, outside, coming to, from the picture. So a region of space inside some materials, it has this orientation. Another region has this orientation. Another region has this orientation. Another region has this orientation. Another one pointing down, another one pointing to slightly to the left tilted. No, this is completely to the, to the right, I'm sorry. And uh, let me find another one. This is to the left tilted and so on and so forth. This is up, this is down at an angle. This is completely right and so on and so forth, okay? And in normal material, because of temperature agitation, those regions are pointing every which way you can think of and they cancel, okay? They cancel. This is also true for iron, iron, regular iron. This one in here is not magnetized, okay? So this is true for it too. But if I bring a strong magnet to it, next to it, this is what's gonna happen. This region 
will try to align. Let's say, for example, I brought a strong magnet in this case in this direction to magnetize it. So the word in here to magnetize. So this region try to align itself. This is closer, actually. It's easier for it to orient itself. This is actually easier than this one. This is very hard to orient, but it's going to stay at an angle of some sort. But it moves from this direction. This one is extremely easy. This is easy. This is actually very easy to do. This is very easy to do. This is easy to do. This is going to be extremely hard to flip. So it's going to turn slightly. Okay, and so on and so forth. Overall, this entire mag, uh, this entire iron becomes ha becomes magnetized. Now, when I remove that, when I remove this thing, this material now will have regions of space that lean on one another. So this region points up. The next region to it was pointing up. This region next to it was slightly this way and they help one another. So this wants to go back into its random motion because of temperature, but this helps them stay up. This helps this, and this helps that. So it's like you lean on me, I lean on you. So materials have this property. It's called the self-consistent behavior, okay? And depends on the, the material, and some materials do, others don't, okay? That is what makes the difference. So to answer the question is, what causes magnetism? is currents or charges in motion in general, which is what a current is. Charges in motion. In some materials, okay, regions of atoms support one another. Okay, that is basically how this works. Make sense? Come on, guys. Make sense? Yes, maybe? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, very good. So this is basically, in a nutshell, what magnetism is. So in the heart of it, both electromagnets and magnets are caused by the same thing, which is currents. I mean, you're telling me, well, I have a magnet in my hand. Why am I not electrocuted by this motion of charges? Well, this motion is basically on a very small scale and it's closed loop. So you're basically holding the wire by in both ends. And in this case, it's not gonna cause anything. Electrons don't cause anything. If it's causing any problems, then it's gonna cause it everywhere, actually. This too has charges in it. Every material that you can think, even insulators, as a matter of fact, even the plastic has charges in it. And they are actually do they move around too, except in that case, the motion is completely cancelled in insulators because usually they come in pairs. Okay, so this spectra in here is not complete really for the atom because the electrons they come in pairs. When two electrons they, when they sit next to one another, they flip the spin so that both of them have uh, combined have a net spin a net spin of zero. So in this case, they cancel one another, and that is something that when I get into later on, basically, okay. So again, this is the behavior of, so this is unmagnetized, completely random motion. This is slightly magnetized, more or less in one direction. This is strongly magnetized. This is an ideal situation you cannot even achieve for the strongest materials. So this is actually a more practical uh, situation for a magnetized material. And when you cut it in half, so all you're doing basically is just cutting somewhere where the thing is. So you're just putting this, this magnet somewhere else. Okay. So electrics, electric currents and magnetic field, this law is due to Mr. Ampere. And currents create magnetic field. This is basically, in a nutshell, what, what this whole thing is. If you have a, a wire and it has a current in it, and you have a magnetic compass next to it, you're going to see the compass basically change direction depending on which way the current is. The stronger the current, the stronger the magnet the stronger this needle will point somewhere, okay? Depending on the strength of the magnetic field. And the magnetic field follows the so-called right-hand rule. I want you guys to pull your right hand right now. So if you're left hand, you're out of luck. You still have to pull your right hand, okay? And you're gonna use your thumb as the direction of the current. So this is where the current is right now. It's following your thumb. Where the magnetic field is, 
it curls around just like the palm of your hand. Okay, so this is basically the right hand rule. The right hand rule, okay? RHR, so if you hear about the right hand rule, there are several versions of it, right hand rule. There are several versions of it, okay? I'm gonna give you several versions of it, okay? There is the thumb, so again, if you are a left-handed hand, person, it doesn't matter. You have to use your right hand, okay? We discriminate in here against people who are left-handed, okay? <laughs> so electricity doesn't, doesn't care. So, so this is where the current points, according to your thumb. This is where your thumb is. That's where the current is pointing. So whichever you point it, that is where the current is pointing. Where the magnetic field is, is going to curl following your four fingers of the palm, okay? That is version one. Version two of the right-hand rule is, actually it involves something else for it now, it involves the magnetic force too, okay? So which way the magnetic field points, which way a charge moves, and how much force is going to be subject to, that is actually the right-hand rule too, okay? So it's like this. Again, you don't th do this, this is no, the left hand no. You have to use the right hand uh, rule, okay? And there is a third right hand rule, you guys probably have seen it, and that is for rapper musicians too, okay? They use the right hand rule. Have you seen them when they start? No? <laughs> you guys don't know ra rap music? Man, you must be of a different generation that I. Okay, that's the fourth, the third one. Okay. <laughs> okay. When you go to the shower later on in the evening or something, try to do the uh, right hand rule. Okay. <laughs> You're going to enjoy it. Okay. Again, so the right hand rule that we have right now is this one how the magnetic field curls around the current. Okay. Again, it's always curling around this way. So, which way right now? No, it's going like this. So the current must be going this way, okay? Because if it's going like this way, then the curling is happening this way, okay? It's going into the screen. And whichever way you look at it, it's going into the screen. Make sense? This trips even engineering students. So if you guys are not too... At some point, you really have to stop because your hands start to hurt, okay? <laughs> if you use it too much. Anyway, this is the point in here of how this curling is happening in here. Inside the region of space, there is uniform magnetic field in here. That's why these devices are used actually in, in, in electrical devices, and they're called actually coils, and they are used because of this property. They have the magnetic field more or less aligned in one direction, and you amplify the magnetic field. And this region immediately behind them, actually, the magnetic field is zero. And if you have this, are closely packed, okay? These wires are closely packed. You get a strong magnetic field in here and this re region will become empty space, basically. No magnetic field. These are used for amplifications. These are used for actually power uh, transformers, used for all kinds of things, okay? How are we doing on time? Still good, okay? Oh man, still have long way to go okay this is what i was talking about the other right hand rule in here okay so you have a magnetic field in here that is pointing from north to south this way okay you have charges that are moving this way positive charges moving this way okay that's where the current is going so which way this one is going to bend i'm going to follow the magnetic field so why is this pointing that way? It's going to bend upward, not downward. Yeah, it's bending upward. You guys see it? <laughs> it's very hard to, <laughs> I'm trying to follow. Okay, so this is the direction of the magnet this way. Okay, this is the current this way. So the, 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 uh, the, uh, the bending of the wire is pointing up, make sense? 
do it with your right hand. This is the direction of the magnet. It's always from north to south, by the way, okay? Follow this one for the where the current is going. And then where this finger is going, where the, uh, that is basically the right hand rule. So this is the, or, uh, the other uh, RHR. Okay? Try not to hurt yourself, okay? So again, depending on which way the current is flowing, this is going to matter, okay? If the current is going in the opposite direction, so the magnet is still this way. Oh, no, man, this is going to be hard to do, okay? No, this way, this way, it's good, okay. So basically the magnet is from north to south. The current is going to the screen now, so they, now the bending will be down, okay? So if you have difficulty doing it the first time, do it this way, and then basically flip where the sign of the bending is going to be. That's what we use for magnetic levitation, actually. This has uh, char uh, magnetic ma magnetism in it, and this has currents in it, and that will create that repulsive force, okay? That bending, if you wish. That is used for magnetic lev levitation for trains and things like that. So the Earth itself is a big magnet, and it is actually the Earth magnetism that is really uh, harbored life. It is the one that protected life, okay? So it's a very important, played a major role for uh, life in here on Earth because uh, fast particles that come from the sun, charged particles usually, like electrons and uh, protons. Protons are actually more damaging because they have more mass and they penetrate closer to the Earth and they go to the Earth and they are absorbed to the Earth in here. Electrons are going in the opposite direction and uh, they spiral in actually, their motion, and this one spiral in the other side, and they create the so-called, uh, uh, the basically the auroras in the north and the south pole, okay, those beautiful colors, because there's charged particles, they're hitting the atmosphere, super high velocities, they collide with it, and this collision creates basically discharge that basically colors that looks to you like colors because that's how they're in there, okay? So it's the magnetic field that protected and harbored uh, uh, life on Earth and protected it from basically going thin. If the magnetic field was not there, this could have penetrated in here easily in every which point and would have caused devastation on life of any kind of life, plant or animal or anything like that. And this is actually a very good thing because Mars does not have a magnetic field. Mars has no magnetic field. Venus does not have a magnetic field. Uh, Mercury, we don't know if it has one, but most likely it does not either, okay? The reason why Venus does not, this one it does not because its core is basically uh, uh, very inactive. I mean, the, the does not have a uh, radioactive material. It's not hot enough, basically, for it to cause currents to flow. Venus does not have magnetic field because, although it's like the same of the Earth, and it has a super hot core, just like the Earth, because of radioactive activity, However, Venus spins so slow around its axis. So there is a current, but it's a very, very weak current. But the Earth spins fast. It does goes once in every 24 hours. So Earth has a magnetic field. So what causes magnetic field of the Earth? You have a nickel and iron, which are the main components of the Earth core. And those both are magnetic. And they have charges, basically, in them, moving super high speed, OK? Because the Earth is spinning, so it's causing this motion, is causing this current inside the Earth, and that's what causes magnetic field of the Earth. And that is a good thing. Mars does not have a high, a heat enough, although, although it spins fast enough, it spins as fast as the Earth. A day on Mars is 24 hours, slightly longer than the day on the Earth. But uh, Venus, the day on it is like a long, long time, it spins super slow. Okay. So again, Let's look at the time. We still have a little bit of time. So the electric meters or how we can, every device that you have out there, for example, this one has a magnet in it. And that magnet is the one when a current flows through this one, causes basically the, 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 the motion of this needle one way or the other. How much it moves from one way or the other depends on the strength of the current in here, OK? So that is used for electrical devices or for measurement devices, including the galvanometer, which measures super weak currents. This is the voltmeter. This is an ammeter. 
and which is uh, of the order also can be used as a galvanometer, okay? So these are devices that use magnetic fields in here and how the connection between the electric field, I mean, the, the currents, I'm sorry, and magnetic field in this case. So as the current flows in it, now you have a magnet and the needle will move because of that magnet. You remove the current, now the magnet is gone, so it's going to go away. How much it's going to move one way or the other depending on the strength of the current, okay? So this is a good way of measuring currents and voltages and things like that. Another one of this is actually for my, uh, my physics classes, usually I have them do a project like this one where you can actually build a motor, okay? This is the, we did this last time, didn't we? Yes, we demoed yeah. this. Are you demoed okay. that? Yeah, so this is basically how the electron motor works, okay? So this is the, uh, and again, you need magnets. Without a magnet, you cannot have that. If you remove this magnets, it's not gonna work, okay? This is the EM induction, the one that I was going to do, but I couldn't find the coil in here. And hopefully I will locate it before the, somewhere. Okay, probably see this box in here. I don't see it, sorry. Okay, I'll try to find it some other time and hopefully with the demo this one. So this is how actually without a, uh, Current, you don't have a battery. All you have is a magnet and a wire. You move the magnet in and out and the current will flow through the circuit. This is how you make electricity to begin with. This is how electricity is made in the Hoover Dam to begin with. So the Hoover Dam, the way it makes electricity is you have that water that falls and the fall in there. As it falls, it's going to turn the turbines and the turbines, when they spin, they give this motion of the magnet inside those coils, and now the coils, they will have currents in them. That current is collected and sent to, uh, to a basically a power distribution that inclu includes, among other things, uh, transformers and things like that, okay? So this is how power is generated in general. So this is the, uh, the electromagnetic induction, basically how electricity is induced by the relative motion between current and, uh, and magnets, okay? So again, you need motion. If you don't move this, this thing will not have a current. Either the magnet moving in and out or the coil moving in and out. In general, the relative motion between the coil and the magnet creates currents, okay? Relative motion. It has to have motion between a coil a wire that is made out of conductor, usually copper, okay? And a magnet. This is how we can make, uh, creates, or induces a current. Okay, this is in a nutshell what that is. The key word in here, it induces, okay? Again, this is a nice demo. I don't have the equipment for it right now. Hopefully sometime we'll have it. And this is Mr. Faraday. This is Faraday's law. So Ampere's law says the following, a current creates magnetism or induces magnetism. This is what Ampere's law was. This is the one that we demoed or at least when you run a current, you're going to see a magnet. I don't have it in here, okay? And this is the one we demoed last time, which is called Faraday's law. Faraday's law. Faraday's law state basically that magnets, more specifically moving magnets, induce currents. So induces magnets in here, okay, or magnetism. So the picture now, you can imagine, if I have the two going for me, I can have a current that is being induced by a magnet 
which is induced by uh, which induces a current, which induces a magnet, which induces a current, and this story can go forever and ever and ever and ever. Okay, this is exactly how we see. This is exactly what light is. So light is a permanently yes. The source is somewhere uh, in the sun, for example. You have moving charges. Those moving charges now they're current. They create magnetism. Magnetism because it's changing now with the motion of the charges create ele uh, electricity, electric field in here, currents. And currents will create magnetic field and so on and so forth. And this disturbance that is created locally on the sun will travel all the way until it hits at our eyes in here. It takes about eight minutes for light to travel from the sun to here. This is actually what light is. So it's like this phenomenon, the combination of Ampere's law and Faraday's law, bringing light to us. This is actually happens on any star also and brings light to us. This happened also from the light bulb in here. So the electric field and the magnetic field travel in empty space using these two laws, okay? So again, this is the magnetic, electromagnetic induction, okay? The motion in here will induce a current and you can see the needle in here, a galvanometer if you have one, you can see the current flowing. And the power generators, all you have to do is crank this one like I did last time. Basically, I moved it with my finger and you saw current flowing through that, through the voltmeter. So this phenomenon basically is going to be a, an AC current. It's not going to be a DC current because it's going to go from a max to a min, from a max to a min. And this is basically what we have in our households. Okay. So uh, again, if the uh, steam or the wind or something turned this one, you're going to end up with a with a current using Faraday's law. Okay. This is a transformer. Transformer are special devices that work only in AC current. Okay. Every device you have in there, every TV, phone, it doesn't matter, has a transformer of some sort, big or small, inside of it. Because the power supply coming from the company is 120 volts. Okay. You want to bring this one to your phone, which is probably 5.2 volt. Okay, so you need a transformer to transform 120 down to uh, 5.2 volt. Okay, so there is a transformer in here. So this transformer is called the step down transformer because it takes what the power company brings and bring it down to your consumer. Your computer probably consumes about 19 volt. Okay. So you need to bring that also to your uh, to your uh, consumption. Your 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 TV probably works with something similar. Your your other high, heavy appliances like your washer and dryer. They probably use or at least some of the heavy appliances they use 240 volt. Uh, if you don't have a transformer, there is a technique on how to get 220 out of uh, 240 out of 120. Okay, and that is basically having uh, one that sits sits in the middle and putting the other one at a higher voltage. So in this case, if you really need a higher voltage out of the same voltage, you need a step up transformer. So transformer, you have to do is just flip around the polarity of it and it becomes a step up transformer. So this is a step down transformer, okay? So again, transformer relationship, primary voltage, because the transformer has two parts in it. This is the primary. If you wish, this is 204, uh, 120 volts, okay? And this is the secondary. This is your 5.2 volt, for example, okay? This is your consumer end of it. So this is how the transformer works. Usually you plug it into somewhere at a higher voltage. This is the main consumers and you get it into a lower, a lower input. This is the step down transformer, step up transformer will work the other way around. So you start with a small voltage in the primary, and you end up with a higher voltage in the secondary. This is the secondary, and this is a step up transformer. Okay, the number of coils in here or turns will determine if it's a step up or step down, that's all. In other words, the same transformer, all you have to do is flip it around and become from being stepped down to a step up and vice versa. Okay. Transformer works only in AC current in alternating 
currents only. They don't work in direct current. Your phone, for example, or your computer doesn't work with an AC. So not only it needs an AC transformer to bring down the voltage, but also it needs something to regulate the current from changing with time to a current that is fixed, continuous. Okay. So again, this is a transformer, like any device that you have in your home, like your charger, your phone charger, which is really mainly a transformer, really. Okay, this is a transformer. And the one that you see in the sitting in there, that is actually a big transformer that is delivering power to your neighborhood in there, okay? So the electric power, again, is uh, how much power. This is the power that you use in your uh, light bulb. That is equal to the voltage times the current. So the current is in amperes. And the voltage is actually in volts. This is in honor of Mr. Volta. This is in honor of Mr. Ampere. And this, the unit for this guy is in watts, in honor of James Watts, OK? James Watt. So again, the power is in watts. That's what you see when you go and buy, for example, a 100 watt light bulb versus a 40 watt light bulb, OK? So this is the power that you, that you see there. Okay, obviously a 100 watt light bulb will consume more energy and you pay for, for it than a 40 watt light bulb. Again, from the consumption, you have in here some sort of a power generation using, for example, in this case, uh, uh, water and then falling water that is, and then it's going to go through the me mechanism generating power. It's going to go step up transformer because you would want the voltage to be very high on the power lines. So this is usually a very high voltage power lines. Then uh, when it reaches your neighborhood or your city, they bring it down a little bit and they distribute it between the areas. Each area gets its own transformer. This transformer still brings super high voltage to still high voltage. And that high voltage is delivered to your area and that area will now carry that, uh, that relatively high, but not as high as the one that is in between the cities. And that will come to your household at actually 240 volt, then they break it down into 120 volt for your consumption, okay? So this is the power is never created or generated. So those transformers that you think that probably are useful in terms of voltage, they will work on the current the other way around. So this step down transformer, the current in here will be higher in this place in here than in this case and vice versa. So the overall efficiency or the overall basically uh, Transformer cannot create power out of nothing. So a transformer is not a generator. It's not going to make energy for you. So at the end of the day, the power that you get from the primary is the same as the power from the second. As a matter of fact, it's usually less in the secondary than the primary because of the heating, because the transformer heats. If you don't believe me, put your charger phone charger and touch it after a while. You will see it hot. Okay. So there is a loss of energy due to that. So again, this is the process I was describing, how electric field is basically propagating. And that is the source makes an electric field and that electric field creates a magnetic field because it's time varying and that magnetic field will create a, an electric field because it's time varying. And that's how basically light is propagated. Not just light in the visible region, but light in all colors, including the infrared and the uh, ultraviolets. Okay. Okay, then uh, light is produced by the mutual induction of electric and magnetic fields. Speed of light is the speed of emanation of this field. Too slow, the regeneration of fields die out. Too fast, fields will build up and you have an ever increasing. So it has to be the speed of light exactly, okay? So this is basically in a nutshell, how we can see. So you have an antenna. This is dipole antenna, okay? that basically has a power source in here for a current that is alternating. So charges are going up and down in here in this antenna. As they go, these charges now, they create a magnetic field in this region. So this is the symbol for magnetic field in physics is B, by the way. This magnetic field now is changing up and down 
uh, left and right, I'm sorry, because of the, uh, the, I'm assuming the charges are going up and down in this case. So now it's changing with time. So this magnetic field will cause the creation of an electric field. And that electric field, in this case, it's going to be in and out. OK? And uh, so this wave now propagates this way. So basically, this one is going uh, this way. And this one is going in and out. And it's going to propagate in space. OK? So at the end, if I'm sitting a distance away from it, this guy's are going to not need any more thing to continue on their own. At one point, we have Ampere's law, the first one. And the second one is going to be Faraday's law. And they move on from point to point to point to point in space, even in empty space. And they are helping one another at the speed of light until they reach the other point. Eight minutes later, this light will reach Earth from the sun. Okay. 4.2 light years later, 4.2 years later, they reach us from the next nearest star, which is Proxima Centauri, OK? It takes about 30,000 years for light to come from the center of the galaxy to here. So what we're looking at right now for the center of the galaxy is 30,000 years ago, when basically the, the first humans start walking the Earth, basically, when the, uh, what do you call them? Neanderthals were still on Earth, basically, at that time. Anyway, this is your chapter. Please take the review seriously and prepare for the exam. It's very important. I know some of you did not, and I extended it for that purpose. And don't leave it to the last minute and then discover that there are issues like the one discovered yesterday by a few of you that, hey, it's supposed to end at uh, 11.30, but it ended before we had a chance to start it because it landed at 11 p.m. And that's my fault. That's why I extended it. So please don't leave it to that time, okay? Don't discover those kind of mistakes because there will be no more extensions, okay? The exam is on Thursday firm and uh, the review is going to end tomorrow firm, okay? So take care of it today. If you have plans tomorrow, if you have uh, things to go on today, take care of it tomorrow morning. Don't leave it to the evening. Okay, I hope that you guys are ready for the exam and the exam is chapters one through seven only. So these two chapters are not included in this exam, but they will be included in the next one. So let me stop sharing the screen now. Okay? I have a question, Professor. Yes. Um, so we don't have class on Thursday then, right? No, no class on Thursday because technically you're supposed to have an exam on that day. I will be available though during that time for you guys. I will have actually the computer in here. And uh, if there is a problem, you're supposed to communicate that with me. And I think there is a time limit when the maximum when you cannot, basically, I cannot answer any more requests. I, I may be available later on in the day. I have other classes going on on that day. I have actually a meeting on that day too. But the point being in here is if you have something, I'm hoping that during the class time, which is from 9 to 10.30, you are going to go through the exam and discover that problem. And then if it is unique to you, hopefully you can work it out. If it is a problem for everybody, then I can communicate it to everybody and say, hey, watch out for this, or this has been an issue. Here it is how the work around for it or something, OK? okay. So I will be a okay. bit but there will be no class, yes. Very good point, thank you. I should send a reminder. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the recording.